everyone. Welcome back for a brand new episode of The Witching Hour. I am Perry Nemroff, and I'm so happy to be sitting next to Haley Fouch. Hi, Haley. How you doing? I am good. Yeah? Yeah. How was your week? It's been a busy week. Why? I have no, <laughs> just like no idea what you could possibly could be working on. What that? <laughs> you son of a bitch, Disney. And like the thing is... Disney Plus is taking over the world, at least, or our world yes. this week, and there's no horror content there. No, no. There's yeah. like vaguely spookyish genre content. In like Hocus Pocus? Yeah, exactly. Or I think like that's the extent of it. Bed knobs Disney... and Broomsticks has witchy-ish stuff. But do they it's... even have a, a genre menu? Uh, they have. They do. They have... And horror is not on it. No, of course not. They don't Action, have adventure, movies. animation, comedy, documentary, drama, kids, shorts, ultra HD, and HDR. They wouldn't have any movies to put in horror. <sighs> Sigh. Yeah. There's like nothing that even kind of like toe dips into it, or at least nothing at a glance that I'm seeing right now. And that is sad. But at least they are somewhat connected to Hulu and FX yes. and bundles. That's the way of the future. <laughs> bundles. All right. We got a lot of stuff we to talk about We're going to work on a today. collider bundle. So I feel like we need a collider bundle, but also I want to get my foot in the door over at HBO Max and get like a collider suggested list. Oh yeah, that'd be that great. just makes a lot of sense that'd for us. Be perfect. Not that we don't do that for you all day, every day, but <laughs> we want to exist, you know, in a formal space like yes. HBO Max. All right. We have a lot of stuff to get into. We're going to make this a news heavy episode because there's some interesting stuff that's happened and there's stuff mm -hmm. at the box office, there's trailers, all that good stuff. So we're going to kick it off with probably the biggest story of last weekend. And it was Dr. Sleep's run at the box office for opening weekend. Part of me wants to cry every time I talk about the story. It sounds oh, dramatic, but I'm very, yeah. I know, I'm, I'm, I really am sad because you guys know how much I love the the book i'm a big fan of mike flanagan i just really believed in this movie and i thought it was going to do pretty well and it didn't just underperformed it i 14 million dollars mm -hmm. is like nothing for a warner brothers horror release like a shining sequel do you have some ideas on what might have happened with dr sleep well, yeah. What are the biggest ones? Because we, we did talk a little bit on Movie Talk, and, you know, I'm curious to get your take on all these that, you know, many out there didn't realize it was a Shining sequel. It wasn't marketed properly. The fact that it was released two weekends after Halloween and not mm -hmm. before or during Halloween. What do you put the most weight in? Um, the biggest trend I'm seeing is that people are dead ass over 80s nostalgia. They're just over it. Like, it's not performing the way it was two or three years ago. We just saw this happen with Terminator. It's just not something people, I, I, even when I go to movie theaters and I see, I hear the audience respond to trailers of reboots now, it's always, oh, it's always a grown situation. Do you think with that in mind that Charlie's Angels is doomed? I don't think it's gonna do great. No, yeah. I do not. Um, that, yeah, I think, that is an emerging thing that like um, we're probably going to see continue to play out because studios and, and uh, networks and everyone is still pretty fixated on the nostalgia thing. Well, that's that's how it works. It's like yeah. like one super hot thing comes out, studios green light a whole bunch of them and maybe two or three wind up following in that first one's footsteps. But then you get like the other ones years later when the fad has come and gone and right. it's just like nobody cares anymore. Perfect example, the YA uh, book to yep. film adaptation craze. Exactly. Uh, we're going to get a lot of like Gosh, what was a late player in that? Uh, wasn't there one that came out? Darkest so Minds. That's the that one was I was trying to think of. It is on TV all the time. Yes. It admitted, I've never even watched the whole thing through, but whenever it's on, I, like I do kind of watch it. Oh, good, good. I know, it's a weird thing. I, I missed that one. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we're going to get a lot of Darkest but it's Minds like, in the coming years. It was like Hunger Games and then Divergent caught the tail end of it and so did uh, Maze Runner. Yeah. Those were probably the few successes, but then everything that came after Maze Runner and Divergent, I feel like 
Well, did I would next also say that Twilight has a big part in oh, yeah, before yeah, yeah. Hunger Games. Then, no, that's true. So maybe it's that uh, Hunger Games was just perfect timing yeah. to catch the Twilight wave, and then Maze Runner and uh, Divergent got a little of it, and then everything else was left with scraps. Yeah, and those last Divergent films just woofed out. <laughs> those uh, last Divergent films. Yeah. So I was super excited to go see Insurgent, the the second one, and like it wasn't good. But it also didn't say to me necessarily that, wow, Allegiant has no chance whatsoever. But then there was just one problem with Allegiant after the next. I never even saw Allegiant. And I was a huge Divergent fan. I may have. I can't remember, which doesn't say great things. Yeah, I that was a bad situation. to the number of those movies that I actually watched. There are a bunch of them that I'm kind of... I love how we're talking about YA right now, but uh, the Fifth Wave was one that that, uh, oh, that bummed me out a little. Wave. It's not it, that one was too late. That Way was a, late. that was a really good book. It wasn't the best adaptation, but I also don't think the movie was that bad. And then there were there's this other one that I really like called Silo that got picked up in that craze, mm. but never actually came to fruition. And that's a great read. I can go on and on with like, I know. YA books. <laughs> I want to start reading more YA again. I, a, I miss them. There's a lot of good stuff out there. I haven't, admittedly, you know how much Stephen King I've been reading, yeah. so I haven't been reading uh, young adult stuff, but there is a lot of quality stuff out there. There was one I read in college called, I believe it was Unwound, Unwound. and that was some dark, disturbing yeah? shit. Uh, what was it about? It was about, like, basically, or maybe un Unwind. 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 It's like if parents decided they didn't want their children, they could what? unmake them. Can I read of? this description yes. really quick? The Second Civil War was fought, this is the right thing, right? Yep. Was fought over reproductive rights. The chilling resolution, life is inv inviolable. I don't even know what that word is. From the moment of conception until until age 13, between the ages of 13 and 18, however, parents can have their child unwound. Yeah. <laughs> so far, uh, basically, kind of and we're on YouTube now. Um, oh, right. Uh, whereby all of the child's organ, oh my God, are transplanted into different donors, so life doesn't technically end. Connor is too difficult for his parents to control. Risa, a ward of the state, is not enough to be kept alive, and Lev is a uh, tithe, a child conceived and raised to be, oh my God. It's this is really awful. dark. It's really dark and it's really good. Oh, whoa. Um, um I was that I was always I wondering if they you, were gonna try to movie eyes. I that don't one. know how you <laughs> adapt that. It's that is brutal. What what is like the age recommendation on this? It was definitely a YA book. Um it, yeah, it's it's I mean it's under young adult. Oh, <gasps> that's awful. But I'm gonna read <laughs> yeah, it. It's good. It's good. Uh, <laughs> I highly recommend it. But I need to find more more hidden gems like that because they're such delightful reads. Um, back to Dr. Sleep oh, yeah, Dr. a Sleep. little bit, because I do want to talk about this, because it, it is fascinating. And I I think a lot of those factors are viable. Do I think it does better in October? Yes. But um, I we know that movies can horror movies can be released outside of October mm -hmm. and do just fine. Uh, they're not usually released so close to the post-Halloween hangover yeah. sort of thing which I think was a mistake. But there's also, it's funny that some people feel like it wasn't really marketed as enough as a Shining sequel, because yeah, I feel yeah. like that's very clear. It's, it's difficult to step outside what you already know sometimes. Yeah. And it's like, I'm so aware of Dr. Sleep and what it was. And I had been paying so much attention in the second half of the marketing campaign where they were really digging into the Shining connections that to me, it was very obvious, but yeah. I don't know. I keep trying to think of, you know, like my Nana. If my Nana watched the Dr. Sleep trailer, would she immediately make the Shining connection or would she not? I guess, but doesn't it? I mean, it's filled with with either footage or recreation footage. I guess the Shining. so. Um, do you think? And this is a bit of a spoiler, so no, it's actually definitely a spoiler. So if you haven't seen Doctor Sleep, come back in like I don't know, let's say three minutes. Okay. Uh, do you think they should have put Jack Torrance in the trailer? No, no, because I I don't think that was one of the film's best moments either. I really yeah. liked the conversation and how it was scripted, but I don't think the look of Jack Torrance, mm. unless we're talking about. I mean, he didn't use any archival footage, so I guess that's out of the out of the equation. Here, I think they but used one shot, which was the blood elevator, yeah. and everything else they yeah, redid. Yeah, but um, as far as Henry Thomas as Jack Torrance goes, I think putting him in the trailer might not have done enough. Yeah, I think that might have actually turned people off. But yeah, who knows? Like, because obviously what they did did not work, and we know 
from it that that Warner Brothers knows how to run a like a flashback movie Stephen King marketing campaign. They do. They do. I, you know, I'm just trying to think of, you know, the fact that it chapter two made a little less and but it was still huge. I mean, it's still, yeah, it's still huge, but also it chapter one was like an anomaly huge. Yes. Like that, that popped to levels that nobody ever predicted. And you know, it chapter two was still riding that wave. Mm -hmm. So it, it could have been a sign that maybe, you know, as a, a promotional team and, you know, appeal wise, it, it didn't really have as much anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's very, I mean, it's a compelling case because I don't look at it and go, aside from maybe the release date and the general fact that I think nostalgia is out and that the movie should have been a lower budgeted one, which is something we talk about a lot in terms of cutting your losses. That movie? Uh, Dr. Sleep. How much did it cost? I, I thought it wasn't that much. I thought it was 50 million. I, oh yeah, but that's, I mean, that's mid-range budget. That, uh, that to me seemed reasonable and it seems to me like it's, it's like, going to be the only thing that actually saves it. It's mid-range, but for a horror movie, it's pretty unnecessary. I Man, mean, I just can't stand Box Office Mojo. Sorry, I'm never going to stop complaining about this until they go back to the original version. It used to be so easy to look up a production budget and now mm. it's just not. Um, but I don't know. I do, I do think that that budget was the way to go. Like, I don't think they could have made this movie for any less than that. When you think of the talent involved, the amount of visual effects, the sets they had to build, that seems yeah. to me like a reasonable amount. It's not over the top, but I, I, I don't think it's... I disagree that there's no other way they could have made the movie. I'm just looking up what the It Chapter 2 budget was, which was huge, well, I believe. Yeah, that was also outrageous. Yeah. I mean, it's not as big as I actually thought it was going to be. But 70, that's the thing; these 70, are not seventy-nine million. Is not these are that not bad. Marvel movies. the 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 budget meter is different. Like, yeah. what is the most expensive horror movie of all time would be a good benchmark to judge these against, very... as opposed to the most expensive movie of all time. Hold on, hold that thought. So, Doctor <laughs> Sleep has a production budget listed on Google as forty-five million dollars. I'm just curious right now. I'm looking up the Conjuring Two budget. Mm. No, forty million. I mean, these all these all seem very reasonable to me. What What do you think is the the horror movie that might be the most expensive? Oh. Like, I can't think of a single thing. What? What? According to this, this has got to be talent fees. What lies beneath was a hundred million. I guess so. That's crazy. I remember seeing that when I was a kid. What lies beneath? I s <laughs> this is a really weird movie to have done this with. But when I was in sleepaway camp, so I was like early teens. They took us to see, right? What year did that come out? I was, I was pretty young. They took us to see, like in Sleepaway Camp, What Lies Beneath. That's not that scary. I mean, I guess 90, that works. $90 million That's for crazy. that movie. That's crazy. So, What's Wolf? Wolf? Is that the Jack Nicholson one? I think so. I can't tell from this. These, are, yeah. these are talent yeah, fees. They it have to be. talent. Uh, but Prometheus was super expensive, as you'd expect, because that's oh, also yeah, yeah. a big budget well, sci-fi. It's a big sci-fi like, sci thing, yeah. yeah. Um, same for yeah. I Am Legend. Yeah. Oh, the Wolf Man. Yeah. Uh, oh, that, I forgot about that that's one. Insane. Wow. It what does it cost? This says it was 170 million. That, I wouldn't be surprised. That's because that that insane. also teeters into multiple genres that usually call for blockbuster size budgets. So this it, uh, that article said 170. Wiki says 150. Okay. Either way. What the heck? I know. I know. Um, so these are like extraordinary examples. A lot of them are talent fees. A lot of them are big sci-fi hybrids. Yeah. But I would say that definitely like if you look at It Chapter 2 sort of being like a, a, a reasonable benchmark of mm -hmm. a very high budget horror movie outside of these outrageous. Like I, I'm still processing the wolf man. Every time I look at my screen, I'm like, outrage. Oh, uh, I was so excited for that press screening. What the heck? I actually enjoy the movie, but that's an, that's an absurd. I saw it that one time, budget. however many years ago, and I barely remember it. It's totally fine. I think if you rewatched it, you'd yeah. be like, yeah, solid. Okay. Man, we should rewatch that next Halloween just for fun. All right, I would. Because it's a good Halloween. I'm open to Halloween it. Halloween vibe. Lots of foggy skies. I will watch. I will um, watch. But anyway, this this tangent being that I do think that um, Dr. Sleep is a little over budgeted, but I also think there was a lot bigger interest than there actually was, yeah. which makes that budget make more sense. 
there's a reason Blumhouse is so successful because everything costs nothing. Four like four million max yep. to make. Um, and it, you know, it's unfortunate because clearly Warner Brothers had a lot of faith in this, not just as far as funneling money into this specific project, but apparently they also had Flanagan working on uh, Halloran, which, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that there is no way that's happening. If you no. can't conjure enough interest for something that is so, in my opinion, at least clearly a Shining sequel, something like that stands no chance. No, and I, I wouldn't personally have been all that in, interested in that anyway. Neither would I. I love Dick Heller and for how he exists specifically in the books. I, you know, he's good in the new movie and The Shining does what it does with him. But I like Dick's relationship with, with Danny. Yes. And the second you take that out, then. Yeah. And I think we get enough of who he is through the story. Not that there's not more to tell about him. Um, There's also something somewhat underwhelming about a movie about Dick when he has said out loud that Dan Shine is stronger. Mm, you know, like when you have that much, when you have so much mm -hmm. power and then you're giving us a little less in another movie. I don't know. I don't know maybe it would have been great. I <laughs> just like, you, know, you never that's know. That's not to me, if I was in the pitching room, that's not something I go green light well, it. That's something you do with a, with a Blumhouse style budget. Yes. You make it like super intimate. Yeah. Actually now that I'd be more interested in seeing like, like a, some, someone a, a drama the drama leaning horror movie about like, they said this was a prequel, right? It, it would have to be. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean like a prequel to, well, I guess, yeah, it would have to be because it, I, I, sorry, I'm thinking about moments in Dr. Sleep in yeah. particular and that in the books Whoa. he has a life. Now, if we're talking about where Dick goes after Dr. Sleep, now that's a movie I'd be fascinated I would be interested. See. I would be interested in that too. But I also don't think those are answers that Flanagan would be like, I have the answer to the afterlife. Like, well, I'm also thinking about what uh, Dick was dealing with as a child. Yeah. And I don't necessarily think that if you're going for, you know, the horror audience, that those scenes would be extremely appealing. It, it can work, but that's what I mean. More like drama skewing, yeah, character centric, like, really, really, like psychological dark, dark, horror, nasty drama. Like, like we need to talk about Kevin's style of psychological horror. Yeah, um, that could work, but I, I that's never. Warner Brothers never just doesn't happen. seem like the type no. of studio, particularly when it comes to their horror releases, to go in that direction. No. Which to me would would take away, you know. It, it takes away Dick's past. Yeah, but if A twenty four wants to make a Dick Heller yes, movie, now please. that's the place for I it. I would be, uh, I would be into that idea. Uh, yeah, that's a fascinating thing, though. That they, you know, at least it was something that was just in discussion, and it wasn't that thing where we keep seeing where they like we've set a release date for Haller in twenty twenty two, and then they're like, "Oops, sorry." Oh, it's such a like upsetting background. I think I would be less upset about it if Dr. Sleep wasn't any good. Yeah. It just really bums me out that I think, uh, I think Flanagan took this immense challenge on and actually Truly. succeeded and isn't getting the box office credit that he deserves. I think that that's generally what makes me sad about box office overall, because I mean, you know how the comment sections are when I'm wrong with my box office predictions, people <laughs> love to say like, ha ha, you're stupid. You didn't know. And that's, you know, that's after the reports you know come what in people on. who say that actually haha ha, you're stupid because that's a dumb thing <laughs> to say to like, someone it's always like after the reports have come in on money like how did you not know that oh, i'm like sure, oh you're looking sure. at the results right now but like d being wrong with the predictions is not what upsets me i mean it really does like it hurts my movie loving soul <laughs> when a good movie comes out and is not rewarded mm -hmm. like it, it just genuinely makes me sad and so mm -hmm. this weekend made me sad yeah, this industry must make you sad a lot. It's like the emotional one of the roller, number one the things that happens. The roller coaster of doing box office predictions. It's, yeah. it's also because it does come down to a little bit of a math to a degree. So I'm busy calculating things based on previous trends, but it is very difficult, especially when I get super passionate about a movie, not to let my personal feelings like mm. make me want to up my prediction, like have more faith in something. And sometimes that can be valuable because sometimes word of mouth can be a major game changer totally. for a release, but that isn't 
isn't always the case. And, you know, I wound up coming in on the lower end of expectations for Dr. Sleep, but I didn't see a single person out there who predicted it was going to come in this low. No, that's, it's insanely this low. This is a big bust. And it's great. Like, you know, when you talk about reasons why, a lot of times people like to point the finger at critics, which I honestly don't really think is a thing. I think there's yeah. enough cases to show. I, like, I think critics can have an impact, but they cannot single-handedly sink the success of a film. But what we're just like they can't single-handedly boost the success a, of a film. It, yes, if if good reviews made a film a box office success, we'd have a lot more like a twenty-four movies that yeah. are hundred dollar box <laughs> office, hundred dollar, hundred million dollar box office hits. You know, um, but what if you look at Rotten Tomatoes right now? The audience score is actually yeah. higher than the critic score, which is already pretty high if i remember correctly i do believe it got something like a like a b plus on cinema score maybe that tracks that sounds which is right. which is quite good for this type of movie yeah um, and it has right now a 77 percent tomato meter yeah, 90 percent audience score but only 4200 audience ratings which is pretty yeah. grim i'm i'm hugely disappointed do you think Disney Plus launching had anything to do with it? No, I don't think there's a huge overlap in, in quadrants there. I don't think there's a huge overlap in quadrants, but I think I, I do wonder if it's just this time of year or we might be seeing the effects of so much content mm -hmm. on certain releases that we would expect to do well in the theater. That's certainly possible. Um, that's always going to be a factor in today's sort of entertainment environment is the, the wealth of options. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I suppose you could make a case that like people were saving for their Disney plus subscriptions. So they didn't want to go to the theater last weekend, but I do think that uh, that's I probably not make the less factor. of a case for that and more, you know, I am one individual and I'm thinking about spending X amount of hours of my time mm -hmm. watching TV shows and movies. So if I'm watching them all over here in the comfort of my home, I'm not going to then well, go. Again, I think that's industry wise, probably definitely extremely true, but not in this case because Disney plus wasn't out yet. So people weren't yeah, staying yeah. home watching it. And I don't think anyone goes, well, I'm not going to go out this weekend because I'm going to watch something on Tuesday night, you know? Um, may maybe not like go out as in like a social activity that isn't seeing a movie, but when it comes to seeing a movie, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I do catch myself thinking about that a little bit. I mean, yeah. it's a different mentality, I think, with us because it, it is, you know, one foot in the entertainment enjoyment world, but it's also work for us. But I've been in situations recently where, you know, I'm just, I have, I have a free evening and I'm thinking to myself, I could review something right now. Do I want to go and pay to see a movie in the theater or do I want to sit home and use one of the streaming services I already have? And it's like, if I use that block of time to watch a movie, let's say on Netflix, and then I review mm -hmm. it, like, I'm not going to use that block of time to then go see something else. No, I don't like, disagree I'm trying to, with that. Again, like I'm just, saying industry yeah. wise, I agree with you, but I don't think Disney plus was a factor in yeah. Dr. Sleep specific. That was a very convoluted way for me to say I'm trying to make an appropriate amount of my time for content watching and an appropriate amount of my time for other things. Sure. So if that is then taken up by more streaming content, I am less inclined to go out to the theater as well. I agree with that completely. I think that's a huge, huge factor in, in modern entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, Scary factor. It's like, yeah, because... I champion seeing movies on the big screen so, so much. And I really want to see the, uh, the, the film industry find a balance between watching stuff at home and going to the theaters. But when a thought like that creeps into my mind, which is something that is happening more often than not now, it, it scares me because it's true of me as well. Yeah. Nope. I do the same thing. I also, as it's not a secret, I never want to leave the house ever. It's every time I'm in public, it's, it's a, it's a nail in the skull so for like me. Like when you choose to watch something at home, your cats can watch with you. Yes, and if exactly. you watch in the theater, they can't. No, there's so many factors. I'm not going to get sick at home. No one's going to shoot me at home. I don't think I live with really nice people. Uh, there's a lot of reasons I don't like to leave the house and not least of them is that it's so much easier mm -hmm. and cheaper to just hit play. And do we really like succession? So <laughs> I got to stay home and watch it all with him. Yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> Kitty Kitty loved Hannibal when that was on. That was, she was obsessed Dewey with that. Dewey was also very into the Mustang recently. Really? It was just like one of those things and it was a screener so I couldn't take a picture of it. But it was one 
one of those things where it's like I had the the laptop on on like my computer and I was leaning back in a chair. No one could see what I'm doing if you're listening to audio, but I was leaning back <laughs> in my chair, which gives Dewey just enough space to sit on me. Nice. And he just sat on me and was like laser focused <laughs> on that screen the entire time. Well, I wonder what it was about that one that did horses. It. He likes horses. Maybe I don't know. horses. I understand Hannibal why that was really intriguing because it's like it's visually quite something. It's very loud. Yeah. There's a lot to keep your attention. That's funny. The the Mustang is a funny one for a cat. <laughs> so random. Uh, we should do uh, movie reviews for cats. Who's <laughs> interested in that? Yay. Uh, all right. At least two people. Yeah, really? I think there's a couple more that would join us. <laughs> hey, if Even the if they were just being nice about it. Taught me one thing is people freaking love cats. Well, going into this next story here, if you're ready, because this is probably a good leap to make as far as, uh, you know, a Dr. Sleep size budget to something that might have a slightly smaller budget. Well, I asked, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the the, the situation in that um, Dr. Sleep specifics aside, mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts on like, what makes a horror movie either a breakout hit or a total box office bomb? Like I know that each case is specific, but is case by case. But I'm wondering if like in, in the last few years, you've noticed any trends. So in thinking about that, I think it depends on the, you know, the, the time of year and the place that the genre mm -hmm. is in. I happen to think that in the summer of 2013, we were just so desperate for a high quality horror film that would appeal to fans of the genre, but also movie lovers and people who appreciate good storytelling. And that led to The Conjuring opening absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. I think we've gotten a lot of high quality horror movies since. So it's put the pressure on the industry to find that thing, that thing that everybody's talking about. And that <laughs> thing in 2017 became Pennywise. Sure. So I feel like we're in a point now where you need a hook. Hmm. And but when what that about hook something like Get Out, which had a hook, but nobody knew what it was until they saw it? I don't necessarily think that. I think that was like maybe that was more of prestige and word of mouth because it did. It did, if I remember correctly, have that secret screening at Sundance, and that kind of got the ball rolling in a lull during the year. Mm -hmm. I think it was also that one also came down to uh, release release timing. At that point of the year, you usually don't have the biggest hits in the world, and people are probably really interested in seeing something something good in the early months of the year. And then I also think, I think Jordan Peele and his whole narrative as far as him making a film and it being really good and him being the next best thing, and also the content of the movie, how it dug into some really important issues in a very entertaining way. I think it was just a complete package. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden too, we uh, we had the narrative of, oh my God, this release could be an Oscar contender. And that just powered it through its theatrical run, brought it back later in the year. Yeah, and that one what did, did tap into like really prevalent culture convers mm -hmm. cultural conversations in a way that like, you know, just elements of the film became shorthand for things we were talking about on a daily basis yeah. and you could use them to discuss something much bigger and more complex through like this mm -hmm. entertainment lens. And I think he did strive to do the same exact thing with us, but mm -hmm. I think that's where like the culture of naysayers creep in, where it's like, if you don't exceed my expectations sure. on your exceptional first film, then it's trash. But it, I mean, us still did it very still did, well. It's still one of the highest earners of 2019. And it's the only original film it in is. the top 10, I right? think it, it's the highest original. I think it might be the only one in the top 10, but it's definitely the highest original film earnings wise of the year. And so that like, that's so interesting to me because it's, it's obviously it's interesting because it's original and it's, it's moderately budgeted, mm -hmm. which makes it fascinating in its own right. But also there's no like that thing you were talking about the hook idea the the which i think that a lot of studios are also in 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 line with that which is why warner brothers has like seven thousand conjuring verse movies now in like five years um i think that's going to change by the way i agree uh but who knows because annabelle comes home unfortunately didn't take off but the nun was their biggest one yet. There is no way a nun sequel. It, that one I think is an anomaly. I think the I think the nun is the perfect example that caught the. It's not Stephen King, obviously, but that 
followed in the footsteps of it chapter one as being like a massive horror success at the beginning of September. And mm. we're going to see diminishing returns. I, I also think that the nun had a little bit of the anomaly quality. Okay. Mm. But that's, that's one where I think if the executives over there are thinking, Oh, like we can, we can bank on this again. No, you're going to spend more <laughs> and you're going to lose more. So right. don't do it. If any, I think there's going to be a major pivot in the Con conjuring franchise after three comes out. I think whoever, whoever's pulling the strings over there, whoever's in charge of the overall landscape is going to take a big step back. I don't think we're going to see a lot of the familiar evil characters. And I think they're going to go in a different direction. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so like, well, I'm just curious what you mean in that sense, because they are always creating new characters, sort of. So I have two, I have two minds of it. What I think they should do is I think that they should make another series of films and give it to McKenna Grace hmm. because you have Judy Warren right there. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga might be done after this that next one sense. and keep the Warrens in the, in the franchise. You have someone right there and she's super talented. Or I think that a lot of this could wind, a lot of what they've done could wind up being pushed aside for new villains. Maybe somebody like a side villain that they're going to introduce in Conjuring 3 and try to reinvigorate it that way. Like try to make, you know, not necessarily the Crooked Man because I don't know what the heck is happening with that spinoff at this yeah. point. But I, I just feel like we're going to see a very different branch of the franchise jut out from the Conjuring 3 that we we're not even fully aware of right now. I'd like to see like, um, so... This is a bit of a leap. Stay with me. Yes, please. Uh, it, I the, like leaps. The Ip Man franchise, which is an action franchise yeah, yeah. based on the legendary martial artist, uh, they released this year a, a sort of spinoff film that was called mm -hmm. Ip Man Legacy Master Z. Totally different style, different character. He was the antagonist in the third Ip Man, and he, he became the hero in this mm -hmm. one. My point being more so, though, that it was new filmmakers, a very different approach to action, different tone, lighting, all of it was very unique from the Ip Man franchise itself. But that Ip Man legacy title kept it in franchise, right? Yeah. I'd like to see them do a Conjuring legacy style thing where it's not even necessarily the Warren or these demons or this. It's still maybe the world, but it's like new filmmakers, new vision, bringing exactly what you were talking about, what we were hungry for in 2013, but a new take on a very, you know, decently budgeted, elegantly made, really well acted haunted house slash possession classic horror movie that's not so tied into building a universe. Like La Llorona? Uh, no, not like that. Because that, like, still was bathed in the Conjuring yeah, exactly. franchise it's look. still the aesthetic. It's still the tone. They ultimately even made an effort the, to tie yeah, it to, in. To connect them. I mean, very different, like... Well, I do wonder if maybe the way to go is is McKenna Grace and maybe even make it, I, part part of me doesn't like that I'm saying this, but may, maybe make it a little more kid-friendly. Because right. I do think we need more kid-friendly horror franchises mm. out there. It's like Goosebumps seems to have fizzled out. The Addams Family just did very well. I have a good feeling about Scoob next year. Yeah, but it animated so different. Animated, like animated is very different, but I still do think there's a place for the new generation to get their, you know, hocus pocus, gremlins, totally. something that feels safe for younger moviegoers. Sure. Safe, sure. but safe, but dangerous. Yeah. And I, I don't just, I just mean like when I say animated, it's different. I mean, it's like box office wise, totally oh, different yeah, ballpark. Yeah. yeah. There's um, a lot of different factors in play when you're predicting animated yeah. returns. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing that, but I also really would like to see them deliver some genuinely scary R-rated, like. I, I'm still all in on the Crooked Man. I want that. I like. I loved the look of that. I love I like the look the of that character. I like the look of it. I just, like, it's, maybe it's, I, these characters, they're spinning. Ultimately, what The Conjuring did so well was bring these characters into a tight character. Uh, I'm using character too much. A, a human-driven story okay. with great character demons who were like accents within the story to make it better. Those signature James Wan designs. Now it's becoming about those designs and less about the human story that they're peppered into. It's more the humans are peppered into this demon mythology. And I'm, I don't think that has a Extremely lot of legs. Extremely accurate way to describe the nun of yes. all movies. I think that, uh, I think that is not true of Annabelle creation, which might be why that's one of the spinoffs I like the best. I, 
I like Annabelle Creation. I really love Annabelle Comes Home. So that's do, one so that's kind of still breaking so do my I, heart. But when you say when you say the, I think that the the leads in that movie were fairly strong. But I also think that the villains in that movie were kind of just as strong. Mm -hmm. It's like the Artifact Room and Annabelle were just as much of a characters a, a character as the human leads. Yeah. Yeah. It's I, I, so I guess we don't have the answer to why horror movies bomb or succeed, but it's an interesting conversation yeah. to explore. I mean, it's one, of, it's with any genre, it's, there's never one answer no. ever. There's always multiple answers. Those answers change from year to year. Those answers change from weekend to weekend, depending on what is happening in the real world. What else is happening in entertainment, whether it's sports or music or anything for that matter. And also what other releases are coming out that weekend. There's yeah. a million and one factors. There's a, of course, that's always true of every film, but there's also like that thing we were talking about, like there are noticeable industry trends. There's the post twilight yeah. young adult trend. And I just, I want to take a better look at this and try and see what the if, trend is of like, what, what is big right now? Like if you, if you look at certain time periods, like let's say you can look at the 2000s and go, that was our time period where like J horror adaptations were so cracking yeah. and then they died off. I'm, I want to know what our trends are. And I guess it needs a little bit more of a, a window I, back. I almost feel like there's no real trend to latch onto because the one trend is the Avengers end game of the bunch, which is way too lofty of a goal for many filmmakers to reach right now because <laughs> nobody has the resources that Disney does. But then I also think yeah. that so much focus is being put on the delivery of the content that the content itself is like a secondary thought how do you mean that do you mean like streaming versus theatrical yes okay i feel like everybody is so focused on building strategies for how to deliver the content that it's almost like it kind of almost is about right now building the library, like getting as much mm. as possible and not necessarily producing that game changer. It's like when you think about the time that something like Stranger Things came out, Netflix didn't have nearly as much competition. They were starting to plan for the future appropriately by building their own library. But that was like like a, a random hit because they had faith in the Duffer Brothers and their idea yeah. and they were able to make it exactly what they wanted to make it. And it's something that really caught on. It doesn't feel like we're getting much more of that anymore and the th few things that are hanging on are getting overshadowed by the immense amount of content out there yeah man it's scary what a tricky time in the industry it's scary i was when i talked to jason blum last i asked him if they had any like ideations for a blum uh, streaming service and he was like nah they should just team up with shutter he kind of suggested that if yeah. they were ever to do that it would be more of a partnership type thing Which is, yeah i think yeah. they should do that what happened to, to BH Tilt? Is that still Are harm? they still kicking? I don't, I don't know. know. I just, I, when we just brought that up, I remember <laughs> I haven't heard the name BH Tilt in I a while. I wonder if they'll end up on like Peacock or something. Cause then NBC, that's their that streaming service, Universal. I, I actually found this interesting is, um, not to jump ahead to the next thing too soon, but yeah. is Fantasy Island a Blumhouse movie or is it just a Jason Blum produced movie? Ooh, curious question. I'm, Let's dig into it. Technically it's a Sony movie which I found weird when I looked it up. It's just like, it's, it's funny for me to realize when Jason Blum can produce things, but it's not done through Blumhouse and through his universal arrangement. Hmm, that's interesting, like, because it has such a Blumhouse feel to it. I know, doesn't it? Um, no, it is a Blumhouse production. Blumhouse it, it in Columbia, distributed by Sony. Which is... I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess I was thinking of Universal because that's where most of their big hits are, but they, they really do have partnerships with so many different studios with different networks, different distributors. I mean, they have a ton of movies yeah, on yeah. Netflix. No, it's true. It's true. Jeff Wadlow. Jeff Wadlow. What are you going to do? <laughs> what are I'm, you going to do? <laughs> I'm really, I'm, I'm kind of excited about it. Yeah. I think it's a brilliant idea. I, I like the look of it. I mean, maybe that is the way of the future. You dip into nostalgia and familiar name brands, but you turn them on their heads. You make, oh yeah, like make happy series to horror movies and go find like a comedy out there and turn it into a, like go make, go make your friends reunion and make it a bloodbath or something. <laughs> That's interesting. Now that would sell. Um, my thing, like, I'm I'm wondering if we're at the point where these IP titles are actually driving people away. Whereas if, so something like, let's say, Child's Play. Um, let's say if they had instead just made a movie about a killer doll and branded it as original and invested in it, 
being an original, I, you know, property instead of doing rebranding as something that nobody was really asking for. In fact, that fandom was still pretty locked into what was already happening with the current series. It's funny how that's the opposite example of Dr. Sleep. It's yeah. like, do you make more money if you call Dr. Sleep The Shining 2? It's like they went with child's play and it still didn't do anything for them. Yeah. I also think the other issue with child's play was how close that was released to Annabelle Comes Home. Like you mm. had two killer doll yeah, movies in like didn't. two weekends. It's crazy. And yeah, neither of them did very well. Yeah, that was a mistake. I don't know, but like, I, I do wonder- I keep coming if, back to oversaturation. <laughs> like there's just too much. There is, but I, I do firmly believe that people are sort of moving away from IP. So this might be the benefit of there being too much. So there's so much stuff out there that maybe we are seeing a trend where people are going to seek out the extremely different. I mean, yeah. look at some of A24's releases. No, they're not, you know, making a hundred million dollars plus opening weekend, but you got a lot of people this year talking about Midsommar. So oh yeah, may, maybe, you know, Maybe that is the trend in the future where, you know, A24 movies are opening with, I don't know, 10 million, probably a little less, but down the line, there's gonna be more urgency to find that stuff. Maybe, I'm curious. That I'm, sounds I'm, like wishful thinking. I'm I mean, very I feel like curious an idiot. <laughs> to see how Fantasy Island does. I'm very curious to see how Black Christmas does. I'm very curious to see, what was the other movie? I'm very concerned about Black Christmas. Yes. Not from a quality standpoint. I just, I think that might, um, the more I think about it, the more I think that that time of year might be a little bit of a dead zone. I, I don't have high hopes for its financial success, but I hope that it's a good film. Yeah. Um, it, something like Fantasy Island feels more like one that could surprise you because I yes. did enjoy the trailer and it also does not entirely, well, yeah, it is entirely reinvigorating the the idea of the IP, mm -hmm. but also the look is so different. Yeah. The tone is so different. It's got a great ensemble. Yeah. Also, Jeff Wadlow just did Truth or Dare. There was another one that had enough of a hook to make yeah. a pretty substantial amount opening weekend. I think not only can this achieve that, but it might even surpass it because of that February 14th release date too. Yeah. That, that has turned out to be a pretty hot spot to release a movie and to find that one random one that pops and who knows it could be this one i like what i like about this it kind of has like did you ever oh why did the freaking name of it just go away from my brain Wait, why am i describe so it and let me guess it was the cbs slasher tv show uh, CBS, set on an island cbs slasher tv show set on an island Oh my All gosh. I keep thinking it was only one season. I love it. Harper's Island. No, I never watched that. Oh, it's so good. Really? Yes. Okay. Uh, this kind I would of watch that. kind of evoked that for me. Although this seems to be a, a lot more uh, fun energy and Harper's Island. <laughs> All I Island keep is thinking of that now is bleak. I still know what you did last summer when they go to the resort. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that also definitely came through here. Let's hope it's more Harper's Island than I still know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, just looking at the uh, the competition right around then. Oh wait, no, oh, box office mojo, you strike again. <laughs> oh, it used to be so easy. Eh, no, there's eh, there's a lot of competition. Yeah. Uh, so the weekend before, it's oh. Birds of Prey and The Lodge. And granted, The Lodge is very good. It's probably not gonna get a wide, wide release through Neon. So I don't know how much direct competition that one's gonna wind up being. But then on February 14th, we have The Kingsman, which, oh. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think it looks great. I'm really excited to see it. It's like, that's a great example of taking a franchise and then spinning it off in a completely different direction that I am really feeling right now. But that that's a lot of competition for the beginning of February. Yes, it is. I do think that- And Sonic the Hedgehog. And Sonic that's, the Hedgehog. I don't know what to make of now that. Now with less teeth. Um, <laughs> it's bigger eyes. Bigger eyes, gotta have them. It is, I don't- it, it could still be a surprise because The Lodge, like you said, probably won't have an enormous release. And even The Lodge, from what I understand, is kind of like a feel-bad horror movie. Oh, it is. Where this seems more of a fun time. Um, and it's definitely, you know, with the Fantasy Island setting, kind of selling that mm -hmm. fun time. I don't know. I, I feel like this could surprise. Just to scroll down, like, I can't believe this exists. <laughs> Brahms the boy, too. Too. Hey, Meanwhile, hey, not a smart move. Fantasy. So you have uh, the Lodge, Fantasy Island, and then the boy too. Yeah, 
What if that ends up being the big doll movie Please that makes all the money? <laughs> Actually, I take it back. You could say that and I will be wholeheartedly behind it if it's a good movie. Right. I also, like still to this day, I need to stop judging the boy because you know my, the boy story. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. Well, sometimes you don't have a couple beers before you see a movie because <laughs> then you think someone's messing with you when you walk out of the movie and they go, spoiler for the boy, he was on the walls the whole time. Yeah. And I thought, I thought they were messing with me. <laughs> You know, sometimes alcohol and cinema don't mix so No, they well. don't. Actually, Unless you're in an Alamo draft house, then yeah, you should get a boozy milkshake and watch a movie. That's really the only place where I like to drink when I watch Is movies. It? Yeah, I'm the same way. Otherwise, I, I don't like to... I, if I'm drinking, I want to be doing something else other than watching a movie, usually. I think, yeah. I think I'm right in line with you. Uh, also, because like, I, get, I get sleepy very quickly. Yeah, me too. Like, especially if I don't keep it up. Like maybe yeah. if I was drinking throughout an entire movie, I'd be okay. But if I had one beer at the beginning of the movie and finished it midway through, not only would I be sleepy, but I'd probably have to go to the restroom. That's true. And you'd want another beer. That, well, yeah. I would want another beer. I don't mean to speak for your alcohol. No, I would tendency. probably want another beer, but I would be <laughs> conflicted about having the beer. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, I'm mixed on, mixed on beer drinking during movies. But if you're at Fantastic Fest, Fantastic Fest. Yeah. Rebrand it. No, there's something there's something spoonerism-y about that, but I can't Fantastic. figure out what it is. It's like it's like because technically it would be st it would still be Fantastic Fest. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work on this. I will say <laughs> the other IP that I think has a chance of doing quite well is The Invisible Man, uh, based on the reaction to the trailer, which was very positive. <laughs> this is messed up. Th like this February, you know how I'm all like more horror the better, but <laughs> you do not. You do not do one week in the lodge, the next week in Fantasy Island, then Brahms the Boy 2, and then the Invisible Man. Yeah. This seems like a very dangerous scenario where I don't know if there's an opportunity for one of them to really pop. Mm -hmm. It just seems like they're gonna hurt each other. I hope one of them moves. Well, it is interesting that um, two of them are Blumhouse and they're so tight together. Oh. I mean, they're not the distributors, but like. I would love, I would. I would love to talk to Jason Blum in the near future and to be able to ask him about this release strategy. Yeah. I'm genuinely not, not to be critical. I'm genuinely curious what a conversation behind closed doors is like to figure out this kind of calendar. I bet he'd give you a great answer too. He probably he's would. pretty straightforward and if you no, ask I questions know. I, like that. I love talking to him. I think uh, he's wonderful. Yeah, The Invisible Man, I don't know. People just were way more hyped on that trailer than I expected them to be. It's a good trailer. Be. It is a good trailer. And I, I think that it's sort of the same thing we were just discussing, which is taking it and then doing something completely yeah. different with it. I also it. think that uh, Lee Whannell built a lot of goodwill from Upgrade, yeah. which that one was a lower budget movie that really caught on, whether you saw it in theaters or got it on some form of home release. And I think that, I think there is, like not even just in our bubble, I think a little beyond it is a lot of interest in what he does next. And mm -hmm. when I watch that Invisible Man trailer, I see him using the skill set he used really well in Upgrade and just applying it to a different scenario, which to me suggests that Invisible Man will hopefully be as good as Upgrade. I hope so. It was funny when they released the, you know, right before the trailer, they released the first images, yeah. which are ridiculous because it's just Elizabeth Moss reacting to nothing. And mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's not how you saw that movie. Uh, but I was thinking of the way he used the camera and upgrade. And mm -hmm. I'm really, I think he's going to do some exciting things with the idea of an invisible movement. Yeah. I think it's going to be, you know, like, like upgrade was, was STEM part of a man and mm -hmm. how he, he shot that. I think he's going to have some really interesting visual choices to shoot an invisible man with Elizabeth Moss. I think yeah. there's even, there might've been one or two shots in that trailer too, that reminded me of specific framing in that movie also. And I dug that because I really love upgrade. And Elizabeth Moss, like, you know, she's not, her smell obviously didn't blow up because she's so popular from the handsmaid's tale, but she does have, because of sort of that streaming presence in people's home, uh, a name brand yeah. quality uh, added with Mad Men, obviously. But. Hopefully, it serves Invisible Man better than it did the kitchen. But the kitchen didn't earn, didn't deserve any more money than it made. So I didn't even remember that came out. Oh, don't! Did you ever see it? No. Oh God! I have not heard. What a I think, bummer! I think that's the movie bummer. this year that I've heard the most people just being like, "What." You know, that might be. Uh, it's definitely in my bottom five. Mm. I don't know if I like hate hated it though because okay. usually when i talk about worst of the year and i don't really like talking about worst yeah. of the year because i always do remind myself that you know whether the whole movie came together well or not there's always somebody who delivered good work as part of that production but mm -hmm. i did kind of like hate watch slender man 
Mm. I was really put off by happy time murders. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I feel as extreme about the kitchen as I did not about yet. those, but it's not good. Yeah. I don't, I don't usually have like a bottom in my mind. Um, and I tend to like a lot of movies people don't like anyway. Like I'm pretty, pretty easy going, but I also often skip the ones that people know, are like, that is the worst of the year. Just curious what's at the bottom of my list, right? I really have to update this. There's so many titles on this list. Oh, I mean, <laughs> you know this one. The suspense. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Aww. I guess I could say it, right? Yeah. So uh, one of the movies that I watched at uh, at North Bend is on yeah. the bottom of my list, or close to it. It's Monument, yeah. and it's and it's not it's not for you know thinking it is the worst thing I've ever seen. It was just so so not for me. But there are so many admirable qualities about it it's that true. I can talk positively about that movie. I just never want to watch it again. That would be Coco de Coco Day for me. Yeah. I can say that's, nice things about it, but I don't ever want to see that, it. That's not not too much higher <laughs> on my list. Monument <laughs> would be much higher for me. Um, yeah, right right now at the very bottom of my, oh, I feel like a jerk saying this, but at the very bottom of my list is also a movie that isn't there because it's, uh, speaking of which, I don't have the kitchen on this list now that I'm thinking <laughs> about it. That figure might, out where to sort actually, it. Actually, that might be my bottom bottom wow. now that I'm looking at it. But the one that I was also going to mention is a, a Naomi Watts movie that I saw at Sundance called The Wolf Hour. Mm. That's like another one where it just, like it wasn't for me. I was kind of waiting for something to happen that never happened the entire time. And I walked out feeling like empty oh. and kind of like I wasted my time, but it's not to say her performance is bad. There's some interesting directing choices in it. So I can find things that I can talk positively about, but that movie is also another movie that I never want to watch again. Mm. It's uh, It's been an interesting year for film. And like, we'll talk more about this in our, our you know, wrap up of the year episodes. So like, I do feel that we just had maybe a run of like five unbelievably good years in cinema mm -hmm. and that this year was just good i can't wait to talk about that more because i think i kind of disagree i think we've seen a whole lot of very expensive flops mm. or more specifically studios that have the luxury to spend a lot of money spending it on stupid things <laughs> but when you isolate it to some of the best it's like i'm looking at my top 10 right now and it's like, I saw a movie this year that moved me to tears and encouraged me to run a marathon. I can't nice. think that 2019 was not the greatest year of film. I saw a movie that was a culmination of decades worth of superhero movie making. It's, yeah, there's sure. a lot of incredible stuff in the mix. I don't disagree. There's like, we have, I, how many movies were released in theaters now? Or not even just to theaters. Crazy I just, amount. I've, I, I, um in recent years have felt sort of overwhelmed. And to be fair, we haven't fully, we're not fully into award season, which is when I do see a lot of the movies that like make me feel spiritual things. And um, a lot of You should of those, see Uncut Gems, sorry. I oh, just I like- cannot like, there was, wait. You know when sometimes like you say something and you can't stop it? Like that yeah. was going to dribble out of my <laughs> mouth at that exact moment, no matter what I did. Usually at this time of year, my letterboxed uh, rough list of my top films of the year is overflowing and I'm already at a place where I'm like, I have no idea how I'll get this to 10. Right now it sits at nine. So that speaks to how I've responded to film overall this year. Are yeah. there things on there? Yes, Avengers Endgame, of course, is very high up there and that's a spectacular moment. Midsummer means a lot to me as a film. I'm obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. High Life, obsessed with that movie. There are still incredible movies. I just, I have seen less of them and my list is noticeably more condensed than it usually is. I've got a, a fairly significant list. And like even the list that I'm looking at right now, it doesn't account for all. I, I don't think I've added and like all of my TIFF movies still exist in another document. Mm. I have to slide them in. And also it's like, this is the time of year when I need to start rewatching things. Yeah. And really, that, that's the only way I, I become confident in my ranking is if I watch them in such close proximity to each other, which like, is a terrible habit to be in because it means I can never rank things without watching a million things over. I get that. I'm, I'm similar, but I, I, I find the opposite that watching them all so close together often makes me make decisions that later years back, I just revisited a lot of my old top 10 oh, lists really? and I was like, 
Oh, mm. you put that so high because you just saw it. That's recency bias. Do you bias. have any number one in any of those lists that you're like, what was I thinking? No. Really? No, but I, I have things that are like number three or number two that maybe would have gone back to like. Can you give us one example? I'll give you one back, I promise. Uh, well, this is a bad example because I still really love the movie, but I just don't think it would be in my t like my number two spot. Yeah. Um, the Shape of Water, which I, I adore oh. that film, but reevaluating the films that came out that year and looking at my list, like that movie has not endured for me the way the rest of the huh. films on that list have. I had the opposite reaction mm. to Shape of Water, where that would contend for my number one spot mm. in in hindsight. Um, my, mine is randomly, I, I was very surprised when I remembered that I ranked, um, oh my God, now the uh, War Horse as my number one Whoa, that year. That is a yeah. twist. I, cause I think it was because I went into it very concerned about being too, uh, like too upset by any kind of animal violence, but I found so many of the storylines in it very inspired. I got like very mm. obsessed with War Horse that year. <laughs> I just like, I, I can't really explain it Not anymore, but- a sentence I expected to hear today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that, that's probably my one, my one slight question mark in recent years. Yeah, there's nothing on my list that I'm like, what a trash decision. Oh no, 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 I'm not saying that yeah. whatsoever. I mean, re really, I would wholeheartedly put War Horse in my top 10. Yeah. It's just like, I'm. Looking back, I'm surprised it was my number one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, we have to make these decisions in a very intense, very movie filled environment. That we do, that we do. And usually like, not just in an intense list, end of the year list making environment, but while we're also doing 500 other things yeah. and it's a lot. I'm always, I'm it's always uh, cramming in screeners up until the, the like literally the day before it's yeah. due just cause like, what if this turns out to be the one? And that's where I think sort of the like recency bias can come in. If you see something really late in the game yeah. that you love, but you haven't had time to reflect on it the way you oh. did something you saw in January. We're having that conversation with um, Collider FYC right now. I mean, the other, the other day we did an episode about our best picture predictions and uh, soon after Endgame hit theaters and I loved it and it made a crazy amount of money at the box office. I was sure that was gonna get into the uh, the best picture race, but when I did my first pass at my top 10, I forgot about it. Oh. Completely forgot about it. And it oh, wasn't wow. until someone was like, where's Endgame? I'm like, where is Endgame? I just realized that my standing list does not have Parasite on it yet, so I'll fix. Yeah, Parasite's not on mine yet either. Fix that. Got a, Gotta add that. I have a lot of things to add to this list. Um, Avengers yeah. Endgame is likely to end up pretty high on my top 10, even uh, all these months later. At this point, I I don't even, it's, it's still number one on this preliminary list, but I do need to start reassessing all of this because yeah. I have seen a couple of extremely impressive movies lately. And it's like, I don't have waves on this list. I feel like loose is too low. I, <laughs> I, I can't, it's gonna stress me out. Um, we do have to wind down. We, we had like these, these little other store. It, well, one, we should definitely announce one of them just for love. Yes, yes, just for love. I want to read the official. Uh, I want to read the official thing so everybody gets the full picture. Good. Um, a good friend of of ours, of Collider, just in life in general, wonderful of a person. Former witching hour visitor. Yes, a, a witching hour visitor. My um, my uh, like greatest uh, collaborator in all of film school, and then after he scored a really big opportunity that we will get to cover more extensively yes. later in the year. It's, it's Erlinger. He finally like has like, uh, I was just waiting for something like this to happen because yeah. you know, child eater was our first feature together. And as much as I adore the movie, looking back at it, I'm like, we could have done that better. <coughs> Excuse me. Then all of a sudden he made rift yeah. and rift is it's so refined and i'm not just saying that because he no. is one of my greatest very friend. elegant movie I, it, it's like i don't understand why it wowed me so much because i should have known he's been <laughs> capable of that kind of excellency all along but then he makes rift and i'm just waiting for him to become a household name and he is taking a baby step towards that with this wonderful opportunity he is writing one of the installments of into the dark for hulu so just to give you a it, it's it's on deadline i'm so excited it's on deadline Yay. so into the dark he's doing the new year's eve themed episode 
episode, which is titled Midnight Kiss. And it's got a really cool cast attached. He wrote the script. It's directed by Carter Smith, and it's going to premiere on December 27th, obviously right in time for New Year's Eve. And if you want to know a little bit about what it's about, Midnight Kiss follows a group of longtime gay best friends and their resident fruit fly as they head to a beautiful <laughs> desert home to celebrate New Year's Eve. One of their annual traditions is to play a game called Midnight Kiss, a sexy but ultimately dangerous challenge to find that special someone to help you ring in the new year. As friendships have grown strained with secrets, jealousy, and resentment, the group faces another challenge when a sadistic killer wants in on the game. Relationships are put to the test and truths are revealed as the night turns into a fight for survival. I'm going to tell you right now, bookmark December 27th, because again, I believe in Erlinger so much as a friend and as a filmmaker, you're going to want to see his early work because there is going to come a time when someone's <laughs> going to be like, how have you not seen that Erlinger production? So get yes, on it. Watch, absolutely. watch this. I'm so excited. And I, uh, I'm excited about who's directing it as well. I really like the ruins. Yeah. And I, I think that's a super I underrated am a big film. fan of the ruins. Yes. So the ruins is actually a Nemiroff family favorite. Nice. I, I think it, it's one of rough. the rough. <laughs> is it, it? How weird is that? It's like something about, uh, Final Destination and The Ruins, whenever those movies are on, my whole family is just like in silence, locked in, loving movies together. I, Beautiful. I can't explain it, but that's what it is. All right, we gotta say goodbye. Gotta go. Haley, where can everyone find all your Disney Plus content <laughs> on the internet? <laughs> you can find my Disney Plus content on Collider.com. You can find my other content on Twitter at Haley Fouch and on Instagram at Haystack McGroovy. And you can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. That is it. Another episode of Witching Hour in the books. Thank you so much for watching and listening. You have officially survived the Witching Hour.